danger, excitement, adventure. Boston Blackie. Enemy of those who make him an enemy. Friend of those who have no friends. Yes, sir. That's Boston Blackie, and he's quite a guy. Blackie. Hi, Jim. I'm certainly glad you came down. Oh, you remember Mary, don't you? Oh, of course. Excuse me, Mary. Good to see you. Uh, I'm just so fouled up on my first case. Oh, Counselor, you remember Whitey. Hi, Hi Whitey. How are you? <laughs> like I told you, Blackie, when I phoned, I've already landed my first client. A real, live, human-type client. What kind of a rap are you trying to be? A uh, hit and run. My client killed a milkman out near Encino. My client happens to work in a department store, a window dresser. He's all right, Black. He's not the brightest guy in the world, just a nice, friendly kid. You like him. Well, what kind of a jam is uh, our boy in? Well, I'd rather you got the story straight from George. The fact that he can tell it with a straight face is the main reason I believe him. It's one for the books, Blackie. Why do you stay here? Mr. Markham, Hello, any George. luck in getting the bail reduced? I'm afraid not, George. But I brought along a friend who's going to help us. Blackie, this is George Grenoble. Boston Blackie. Hello, George. Hey, I've heard plenty about you. I guess if anybody can find that brunette, you can. Jim, you didn't tell me there was a woman mixed up in this. In front of Mary? <laughs> I'll go out and keep her company. George, you tell Blackie the whole story, just as you told it to me. I'll come back in 15 minutes. Okay, Mr. Markham. George, let's have it. Well, I guess it was my car that hit the milkman, all right. But I slept through it all. Well, who was driving? Well, this brunette. Oh, what's her name? Where can we get in touch with her? All I know is that she was a brunette and wore a fancy dress. How did you meet her? You remember that much, don't you? Oh, sure. You see, I've been up in Santa Barbara. A friend of mine got married, and... Coming back, I got pretty sleepy, so I pulled into this cafe for some coffee. While I was drinking it, this brunette came over and asked for a lift into Hollywood. Look, isn't there some little thing you can remember about her? What she looked like? Well, she was scared. Scared? Of what? I don't know. I guess all I remember is that sequin gown. You see, I'm a window dresser in a department store, and... I sort of noticed women's clothes. I never saw a dress like that before. Except maybe at a masquerade. Kind of a gay 90s thing. Sixman gone. George, you got an idea. It's one in a million. But it might just work. Officer! Lawyer Markham was a darn good cop, Blackie. You know this won't work. Maybe not. It'll give Mary a chance to do some window shopping. Here, it, it should flare out differently. And the neckline isn't right.
That's it. That's the dress. Good work. I guess it'd be expected. It's a very exclusive model. Something for one of the leading designers. Why don't you come clean, George, and admit that you imagined this stain? She doesn't exist. George, on the advice of counsel... Oh, don't worry, Jim. If she does exist, Black, he'll find her for you. You can depend on that. Oh, come on, Mary. We've got work to do. Do not walk. Flow and leave your bones somewhere else. When you model one of my creations, you're not supposed to have any bones. People come here to see my gowns, not your skeleton in action. Now try it again. Mr. Severy, I, I presume? Nonsense, I am Severy. That is sufficient. Well, have it your own way. I'm looking for the uh, person who designed this dress. I showed it to one of your competitors. Severy has no competitors. Well, this non-competitor of yours said that you are the only one who could have designed it. The signature of a great artist is in his work. Where did you get this? Who sketched it for you? Well, it was sort of sketched from memory. Who did you sell it to? The gown was designed for use in a cinema. I don't remember the name. The period picture, right? Now, could you remember the name of the studio? Arcadia Pictures. Now get out. Out! Out! Mary, you heard the man. Flow out of here. about a year ago, it was in the papers. Her husband committed suicide. Yeah, I think I do. Still want to talk to her. Miss Collins? Yes, what is it? I just talked to your wardrobe woman. She says you wore a dress like this earlier in the picture. Yes, for the dance hall sequence. Is it so important? It is to George Grenoble. George who? Well, maybe he was too sleepy to introduce himself. But you remember? The chump you left to take the rap for you after you ran over the milkman. Do you know what he's talking about? In case you didn't read the newspapers, the milkman died. So it's not only hit and run, it's manslaughter. Well, let me see if I have this straight. I'm supposed to have run over a milkman while driving someone else's car. Oh, where and when did all this happen? Three nights ago in Encino. How fantastic can you get I haven't been in Encino for years. Three nights ago. I worked late that night. I didn't leave the studio till after 11 o'clock. Well, that's something that can easily be checked. Of course it can. Royce, come here. Anything wrong? This is my manager. Tell this gentleman where I was last Monday night. Monday? That's the night you worked late at the studio. Remember, they shot all your night scenes. I drove you home about midnight. Remember? Satisfied? Or would you like to hear the same thing from the director and the cameraman and the rest of the crew? Well, it isn't likely you could buy them all off. Colin, on the set, please. Coming. You must be a lawyer. Someone trying to get some cheap publicity. Oh, don't try to get it at my expense. I can give you more than you can handle. Colin, please. I'm coming. Find out how these two got a pass on the lot. And do something about it. All right, Miss Collins, I was offside. By dress with the wrong girl. Very sorry. Come on, Mary. Let's silently steal away. Go over to wardrobe at once. Get the sequin dress. You know the one. All right, what'll I do with it? Take it home. Burn it. Destroy it. Do anything. Just be sure no one ever sees the dress again. Particularly that nosy character who just left. Do you think she was lying? Ah. I can't see her using an alibi like that, unless it would stand up. Must have been some other brunette. If somebody else took the dress out, 
Wouldn't the wardrobe department have a record of it? Smart girl. Let's have a look. What's the matter? I wonder what's in that box. Well, from the looks of it, probably a dress. Hey, maybe it's that dress. Yeah. I wonder why Carolyn's iron boy is hustling it out of here. Well, we could ask him. What? Oh, it's... Well, what do you want? I want to settle a little bet. My girl's a compulsive gambler. She says that box contains a man's shirt. Size 16 collar. I'm sorry, I gotta hurry. Now, I say it's a lady's dress. Why don't you be a good guy and let us take it's a look? It's none of your business. And let go of my arm. What difference would it make? why it was important enough for him to risk his neck. Exciting? You bet, but that's only the beginning. And we'll return in just a moment for part two of our Boston Blackie adventure. Blackie, why the formality? Faraday, I want you to do me a favor. Oh, I can't. No, I'm too busy. But I found that dress. Did it have a brunette in it? Oh, no, but... Uh... Well, stop looking. I've got her. You found her? No. She came in voluntarily. Well, surprise, surprise. On me. All right, Miss Collins. Now, what happened next? Well, as I said, he was asleep, and he kept falling over on my shoulders and interfering with my driving. I felt a slight jar just as I was trying to shove him away. I have no doubt. That's when I hit that poor man. I didn't see anything at any time. In fact, I thought I'd just hit a traffic button. It wasn't until I heard that George Grenoble was in jail that I realized I was to blame. It was very nice of you to come in. A lot of others wouldn't have. Come in. Congratulations, Blackie. Great work. Not me. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> well, I want to know if this clears my client of any responsibility. Miss Collins has admitted that she drove the car. Good. Then there's no reason why Grenoble can't be released. All right. Congratulations, George. You're a free man. She isn't the one. What? But what is this? What? That isn't the right woman. But you said you didn't know what she looked like. Well, I don't. But I do remember what she didn't look like. She didn't look like this woman. Not really. What's going on here? I want to find out, and nobody's going to leave this room until I do. If I live to be a million, I'll never understand it. There was George out of jail, as free as a bird, and he had to open his big, fat mouth. Did Faraday hold Caroline? No. No, he checked on that story she gave us at the studio. And he found out that she did work late that night. Then he accused her of turning herself in for publicity. That gave her an out. But why did you confess, Jim? I don't understand. Maybe it's a hobby with her. Or maybe she's protecting someone. Did she strike you as a sacrificing type? 
You know, if Grenoble had kept his mouth shut, she'd be up on a manslaughter charge. And that's carrying protection a little too far. But why, Blackie? I don't know. Well, maybe she thought it would do her some good. Mary, where's that dress? In the other room. Where you get it? Mm-hmm. What about this Collins gal, Blackie? Anything in the files on her? Faraday said she had a husband turn up dead about a year ago. Hung himself in a clothes closet. Here it is. Exhibit A. Very pretty, but without the right gal in it, isn't much use. Right. Why did Charlin try so hard to keep us from getting this gown? Why? Yes, it's quite stunning. Boston Blackie has a sequin dress. He didn't turn it over to the police. Then he knows. I doubt it. Won't make any difference as long as we can get it back. I created the gown especially for Madame's figure. No one else in town could wear it. If we can get it back. My love has a delightful sense of humor. May I assume, darling, that you've already decided how we should go about this? After that latest brainwave of yours, darling, isn't this sarcasm a little misplaced? Confessing to the hit-and-run charge was the tactics of a genius. How was I to know that Grenoble was an idiot? How could you know that girl Miracle Johnson would walk in the day we killed Tony? No, it was never my idea of a solution to our situation with Tony. Remember, you were the insistent one. You couldn't divorce him and... Well, it's the only way out now. We'll never get that dress back as long as Blackie is alive. Are you suggesting yes, I... Yes, I am suggesting. If, uh, if Madame would step into the fitting room, please. Thank you. This is getting us nowhere. Mary, what do you see about this dress that a man doesn't? Well, the sequins are a little out of line on the bodice. <laughs> so the sequins are out of line. Maybe the sewing girl was cross-eyed. Uh-uh, not on a every model. <laughs> Hey, wait a minute. This little spangle has been moved deliberately, and it's been mended. Mm -hmm. Look. Let me see. Oh, it looks like a cigarette burn. Yeah. You want to bet it isn't a bullet hole? We'll get Faraday to run a test on that right away. I'll bet this girl we're looking for is more dead than scared. And that's why Caroline didn't want us to see the dress. Wonder who was wearing it? Well, obviously, someone who had the opportunity to get into the lady's wardrobe and sneak it out. The big problem is to find that person. Hello? Yes, he's here. Just a minute, please. For you, Blackie. Thanks, Mary. Hello? This is Severy. It's about the dress. This morning I was very angry and, well, I'm not angry anymore. I wish you to know everything. Will you come to my home? Why can't you tell me now? It's not to tell you, my friend. It's to show you. Show me what? A grave. A lonely hidden grave in the mountains. Please come at once. Hillside Road in Encino. 75121. Thank you. I'm harsh and cruel. Before my little ones learn how to flow instead of lunge, they hate me. Then I give a party for them and they love me. It was at my costume party I saw the sequin gown again. Who was wearing it? Miracle Johnson. <laughs> Ludicrous but effective. I myself gave her the name. Was she one of your models? Once. Not any longer. She became a, an actress with Arcadia Pictures. So she sneaked into the wardrobe and uh, got this gown. Wore it to your party. What happened to her? She's dead. Killed with a gun down the road there. I heard the noise and I saw the flash. It was dark, you understand. So, of course, I could see no more. And you didn't report this? It was terrible. I banish unpleasant things from my mind. Oh, sure, I understand. You're the artistic type. This will come as a blow, but you're in trouble. We better get the police out here so you can show them Miracle's grave. Oh, but no, I couldn't. Perhaps the body has been moved. Then I'd be a suspect. That's why I asked you to come here. An unimpeachable witness. Come, I'll show you. After you.
lonesome spot. A couple of more rains and the body might never have been found. How'd you know where to look? I followed. And from a distance, I watched them in the moonlight as they buried my little one. You keep saying they. How many were there? Two. Man and a woman? Yes. I need a cigarette. Hand me my coat. You know something? What? Murder becomes more complicated all the time. Just killing someone isn't enough. Nowadays, you have to hide the body, too. It takes muscle to be a grave digger. It's a matter of necessity. And if one is sufficiently desperate, he'll find the strength. I suppose the more experience a murderer has, the more practical he gets. For instance, a real smart killer could get his victim to dig his own grave. Okay, chum, now it's your turn to dig. While you're at it, you can level with me about Miracle Johnson. that hit and run driver. You can have her, but I don't think you'll want her. She's dead. Who's dead? Her name is Miracle Johnson, Inspector. She took small parts in here at the studio. She was blackmailing Carolyn Collins and Severy, the dress designer. They killed her. Well, I hope you can back this up with some evidence. Well, listen to this, Faraday. The night of the hit-and-run accident, Miracle went to a party at Severy's place. Now, he was supposed to dispose of her then, but somehow she got away. Hitched a ride back to town with George Grenoble. Hmm. No wonder she was a scared brunette. Now, when she got back to town... Now, now wait, folks, please, this is a take. Now, when she got back to town, Carolyn was waiting for her. Severy had already phoned in ahead. Carolyn shot her right through that sequin dress. Well... Why didn't they bury the dress, too? Well, because it had to be back here to the studio for the next day's shooting. Oh, I see. So Caroline cleaned off the blood and, and then moved the sequence to cover the bullet hole. Right. Severy took the body, buried it up in the mountain. What Blackie tells me, Severy was going to plant him right in that hey, same but... grave with Miracle. Okay, folks, you can go on now, but after this, watch your red light. Well, this starts to add up. That suicide, Carolyn's husband. I'll bet that really was a murder. You're so right, Inspector. And Little Miracle stumbled in on Carolyn and Severy just when they were in the act of hanging the old boy up in the closet. Well, why do we stand here yakking? I'm going to arrest that woman. a big gunfight. Carolyn's up there on the balcony. She sees the heavies closing in on the boyfriend. As they start to shoot, she opens up on them. You got it? All right, now let's shoot. Okay? Action! Drop that gun, Miss Collins. This is a rough way of doing it, Jim. But I think it'll clear your client. Thanks, Blackie. But the next time, just dig up the evidence. Let me handle the rest in court. I need the experience. Okay, son. Here's your chance to become a big-time lawyer. Come on. She packs a better wallop than you do.
My name is Hicks, R.X. Hicks. I'm your host for tonight's Gangbusters story. A real story of a crime wave in which I was one of the victims. Men who were masters of many disguises used items such as these. And uh, weapons like this to commit over 50 major crimes in the state of Connecticut. Now, in just a moment, you'll see how these vicious men operated. For the unusual story of criminals who earned the name of the Scissors Gang. September 30th, 1020 p.m. There's more than one kind of violence in the air that night. At the Avis warehouse, a human storm was about to strike. Who is it? Telegram from Mr. Avis. Oh, another the door. Can't. You got a sign for it. Shut up, leave it for that safe. Hey, hey, you can't do that thing. Don't walk the whole house. Are you going to shut up? See, I did. You'll see. Here, take these. Let's go. Because of the weapon they used at their first major crime, these vicious criminals became known as the Scissors Gang. Silk stockings are intriguing enough when worn according to fashion, but uh, the Scissors Gang found they could serve a far more dangerous purpose. We were having a little poker game for rather high stakes the night the Scissors Gang broke into my home.
to the hospital and did everything they could for me. After an emergency operation that saved my life, Captain Selder and Detective Ordley waited until I regained consciousness. Mr. Hicks, this is Captain Selder, Captain of Detectives. Their faces looked awful, like zombies. We've got the ejected shells, 32 caliber, bearing the same markings we picked up at other recent shootings and two safe jobs. We believe it's the workings of a gang that's been terrorizing the whole state for months. They look like ghosts. They were wearing masks. A woman silk stocking, we believe. You're tired now, Mr. Hicks. Good luck. You'll pull through. Hi, Kane. Correct the safe, okay? Shut up. Oh, she's all right. No dame's all right. What'd you bring her here for? We got married. Oh, yeah? Wait till the boss hears. Hey, what goes? Why don't you say something? Oh, you hurt her feelings. Why, you... <laughs> big gag. What's a big idea, scissors? I'll show you. Come over here. Well? Get a load of that. And in the closet, machine guns, drills packed in oil, acetylene torches, everything. Okay, scissors, what's the next job? Next job? Do you want to know, too? Next job? There were a lot of next jobs. They were masters of disguise, and they showed their victims no mercy. Then one night, a police officer patrolling the commercial area of a Connecticut city discovered three women burglarizing a building. The masquerade was over. With their latest disguise known by the police, the Scissors Gang knew it was time to put away their stockings and dresses and devise other ways to get money. What's a pitch? Pitch? Yeah, you just don't call and say you want ten grand, don't you? Come on, Scissors, I don't like quiz games. Who are you calling? Hello? Mr. Hicks? Yes? Who is it? Scissors. Who? Remember a poker game at your house a couple of weeks ago? <sighs> that, that was the night I was shot. I, I just got out of the hospital. Leave me alone, will you? For ten grand. For what? For ten grand, we'll leave you alone. I, I don't have that kind of money. Then get it if you want to stay alive. But, but I, I'd need time to raise that kind of money. I'll give you just 24 hours. And if you want to live, don't go to the cops. Police headquarters, give me Detective Captain Selvin, please. Captain. We got your signal. What's up? A telephone threat. The police work pretty fast. They managed to have someone deliver wiretapping equipment to my house. 
And that evening, Captain Selder himself showed up. Now, I have to work fast. The house may be watched. I'm only supposed to be a delivery man. He, he said he, he'd kill me if I told the police. If you didn't tell us, who said he wouldn't? He said he wanted $10,000. Well, what he wants and what he'll get will be different. When did he say he'd call? Oh, uh, tomorrow. You do just as he says. And when you answer, press this button down, like this. Oh, uh, I, I see. If there's an emergency, can I call headquarters? Under no conditions. That's why this setup. On the chance he may have your phone tapped, so we couldn't trace his call. Or if he does have your line tapped, he could hear you when you call us. What'll I do about the money? My boys are hearing this now. And if they don't want to get fired, they're already calling the bank. You call the bank in the morning. Tell them you'll be after the money one hour before closing time. You know, it's my life we're taking chances with. We're fully aware of that, Mr. Hicks. Well, I've been here too long for a man delivering water. Good luck, Mr. Hicks. Delivering spring water late, huh? Tell that guy who just came out. Maybe he was delivering water. Maybe he wasn't. Make sure it isn't a trap. At police headquarters, Detective Ordley remained glued to my Taft telephone wire. I guess this is it, Captain. Operator 27. Hello? Detective Ordley speaking. Check the telephone call now being made to Manchester 1746M. Hello? Mr. Hicks? Yes? It's Scissors. We tail the man who delivered your spring water. If he hadn't checked right into the company, it would have been too bad for you. Made arrangements to get it? Yes, I have. Where? Well, the bank said they'd have it for, for me this afternoon at 2 o'clock. We'll pick it up tonight at 10 o'clock. Put the 10 grand in a paper bag. A brown paper bag. And leave it on the step. At 64 Highland Street in West Hartford. And remember, unless you want something very messy to happen to you, no cops. Call from a pay station? Lincoln Drug Store. No, too late. Don't send squad cars. He may be watching. Have a plain clothes and we'll talk to the drugger. See if you can get a description of the man who made the call. Well? Planning a trap is one thing. Yeah, with the time that's close to pulling. And a man's life depends on it. But you planned a perfect set. Yeah, with a thousand ifs. If this doesn't happen, if that doesn't happen, if he doesn't get scared and blow it, if it's this, if it's that. There's another way to even try to protect him. Maybe there is. Maybe there's a way I haven't even thought of. Selder and Ordley made their final preparations for that night's payoff. At nine that evening, just one hour before the payoff. Yes? This is Captain Selder. We've got troubles. What? The man directly across from the address where you'd leave the package is set up on his front yard. Of all things, the floodlight, so he can see to repair his porch. Well, what's it mean? Well, we don't know. It could be a coincidence or a plant. So we don't dare ask him to turn it off. And the place you're going to is a boarding house. A lot of people going in and out. You still want me to go? That's no, not good. But you're plenty scared, huh? Yes, I am. But if I don't go, He'll be after me the rest of my life. Okay, good. And good luck. Although I was once their victim, now I was the bait. It's pretty rough playing the part of the man in the middle between the police and gangsters.
So many people are going in and out of the house, Captain. We're buffaloed. I'll report to headquarters the second anything happens. What time is it? I can't see. 11.30. It's not good. A dozen cars have stopped here already. People have gone in and out. This sandwich is sure good. Oh, yeah? Ham, lettuce, tomato, mustard. <laughs> you better take a look and make sure the bag's still there. But if I'm being watched and approached, it'll queer things. I can't understand this gang leaving $10,000 in a paper bag like this so anybody can pick it up. Okay, I'll take a chance. Well, if they're on to us, we might as well know it. to the truck. Headed north. Did they touch the bag? Nope. Say, what's a milk truck doing out this time of night? Guys probably live there. It's a boarding house. But they drove off. Normally, they wouldn't have to leave until 3 o'clock in the morning. But the bag's still there. I don't care. There's something phony about that truck. Get after it. Hotline. Car is assigned to case R-127. Follow a milk truck going north on 1st Avenue. Hold occupants. Apparently two milk drivers. Authority, Captain Seller. Idea. Get out. For what? For speeding. Get out. Okay. You, get out too. Okay, Chuck. Take him down to headquarters. For speeding? Just for a couple of questions. Come on. Get going. I guess that's it, Ferris. Hand me the mic. Go through the truck. There may be ten grand in there. Okay. Car 27 on case R127 to Captain Selder. They're on the way down, Captain. I'll follow. The money's gone from the bag. Been taken out of the bag? How do you know? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, I'll come right down. What are we waiting for? So we was doing 50, why the fuss? We paid a fine on that stat, no? So we sit. It's okay by me. I'm good at sitting. Captain. Anything on? No. What about the truck? Clear as a whistle. We practically tore it apart. I suspected that. We got nothing to hold them on. Then that means we chat until they ask if we can hold them. I will tell them that we can't. Bert, wait in the outer office. Now look, I was in a hurry. I was driving too fast. You stop at 64 Highland Street tonight. Yeah, I did. Why? I used to live there. Why tonight? 
To see a friend, Larry Tester. Was he in? Yeah, he was. You can go ask him. Captain Soda. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Where have they found the money? Where? In the attic of the house where the bag was left, beneath the floor. Makes me out a sucker. Well, I'm glad you found whatever you were looking for. Thanks. Can I go now? In just a moment. First, we'd like to try a little experiment. I hope you don't mind. What kind of an experiment? There have been 50 crimes committed, major crimes, holdups, shootings, safe cracking. And by the ejected shells found at the different locations, we're convinced it's the workings of one gang under a master criminal mind. Tonight, an extortion attempt was made. I'm sure it was the same gang. And you think I'm one of the gang? I don't know. Now for the experiment. We sprinkled each bill in the bag with a generous portion of powder, of contiglow. Ever hear of it? No. It's a powerful fluorescent powder that sticks with you when you touch it. All over your clothes, your hands, when you rub your face, your hair, and you can't wash it off for hours. Under ordinary light, it doesn't show up. But under black light, it glows and burns. This is black light. Interesting. A person has no idea how many times he touches his face. You mind if I shine the light in your face? No. Turn off all the lights, Audley. Now I'm going to shine the black light in your face. Well, do you see anything? Worry? No. I thought you might say yes. Well, what about it? Take a look at your hands. There's a mirror. Take a look at your face. No! No, it's not me! And that was the end of the stormy career of the Scissors Gang, a career in which I played the part of a very unwilling victim. It was only through the fine work of the police that I'm able to tell this story now. Scissors and Burke finally confessed their part in the gang's vicious crimes and are now serving long terms in prison, along with Kane, who was arrested the next morning. Now, in just a moment, a gangbuster's clue to a person who is still at large and wanted by the police tonight. Attention, attention to all citizens and police. Wanted for escape from Alcatraz. Ralph Rowe, 49, six feet tall, 170 pounds, gray eyes, scar above right eyebrow. Several stars tattooed on left hand. Ralph Rowe, with at least eight arrests, was sentenced to 99 years at Alcatraz for bank robbery. Rowe escaped from Alcatraz and is now a fugitive. Approach with caution. Rowe is dangerous and may be armed. Repeat, wanted for escape from Alcatraz. Ralph Rowe, 49, six feet, 170 pounds, gray eyes, scar above right eyebrow. You have any information concerning this clue, notify your local police, the FBI, or gangbusters at once. Our next authentic gangbusters case is right from the police files. And on behalf of the police, we invite you to join us. Busters, created by Phillips H. Lord.
you have heard tonight was based upon police records, court records, and personal interviews. 